is a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I, walking down the streets and around campus yesterday, um, many of you wouldn't know this, but Polaris Project and uh, the field of anti-trafficking in terms of the work that we've poured in over the last 10 years, it started a block down the street in a gray house, 185 Angel Street. I lived in the attic bedroom. I don't know if anyone else has lived uh, there at any point in your uh, time here. And that was where the conversations happened that led to the start of Polaris. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about that story. But I was thinking back to uh, just things that you do when you're a senior in college, living off campus and um, the life of a student and in that particular house. And it was very interesting to me, when we first moved in, in my bedroom, there was a crawl space behind, uh, in one of the walls. And I remember thinking, oh, that's so interesting. I wonder if it was ever used in the Underground Railroad, given the history of uh, this region of the country. And to think, 10, actually 15 years later, here I would be working on uh, modern forms of slavery, talking about a building uh, that had housed uh, the seeds of activism back then. But I want to bring you back to where I started and set the stage of why um, some of the terms that you're likely to hear today of unintended, unlikely, where we are today is not necessarily where we anticipated when we first stepped foot on this campus. Where I thought I would be, I was a psychology major, and from the get-go, I was one of those students who knew, I'm gonna go into clinical psychology, eventually have my own private practice, and I was such a science and social science nerd that every single summer break I was here on campus uh, working with professors on uh, clinical trials, uh, analyzing pixels on MRI scans, uh, doing surveys and studies, and uh, spending a lot of time in the sciences library, uh, loving making all these, uh, taking journal articles with me as bedtime reading. That was who I was as a student when I first entered. And, and then in between there, there were all these random classes, or at the time I thought they were random that I took. Uh, city politics, I took uh, existentialism in Africana studies. Uh, I remember debating the pedagogy of the oppressed and talking about privilege and responsibility. And so that, those were all uh, diversions from what I thought my four, the purpose of my four years here would be. And then all of a sudden I started, um, the awakening process for me was not within the classes that I thought was my purpose, but all the classes that um, I remember the most were those uh, classes that I just happened to walk into because some friends were taking it or I, I was looking for something interesting to do. And, and I credit the full spectrum of that education to what I'm doing now. And so if you were to ask me 15 years ago, would you be, do you see yourself fighting against human trafficking in modern slavery? I'd be like, no, I see myself as having a clinical practice and having patients. And here's how it happened. Um, senior year, I I'm a class of 2002, so that's when 9-11 struck uh, our country. And I remember I was up for a super early art history class, eight o'clock in the morning or seven, one of those early classes, and then it was dismissed. And then I remember thinking, as, we were walk as I was walking back to that Angel Street apartment, thinking, oh, okay, I'm just gonna go back to sleep. And of course, that didn't happen because the TVs were on and um, all our worlds were shaken. And for me and the friends I lived with in that house, we started having conversations about the role of religion and ethics and what was right, what was wrong. And over one particular conversation, I remember asking, um, you know, we can sit here now and say, this is clearly right and this is clearly wrong, but what if we had lived back during times when those answers were not clear? Life seems so much more complicated. People um, were debating 
in very different ways. And we started talking about uh, the role, the social issue of slavery centuries ago. And uh, asking these questions of, well, had we lived centuries ago, would we have been, would I have been the person to say, oh, this is just part of our economic system and it's not going to go away. Slavery's been around since ancient times and what, like, why are we, why is our country going to war over this? Or would I have been saying, well, you know, um, I see the oppression, I see people being exploited. It doesn't seem quite fair, but it's not really the call of my generation. Maybe it's some other generation that will take care of it. Or would I have been firmly on the abolitionist side of saying, no, this is wrong. People seem to be really confused about it, but in my own heart and mind, I'm going to be firmly an abolitionist. And it was a very philosophical debate, but I remember thinking, well, or proclaiming over dinner, like standing up and saying, well, had I lived back in the days of slavery, I would have firmly been here as an abolitionist. Fast forward three days, I learned about human trafficking for the first time. Picked up the local newspaper article uh, in the Providence Journal, and lo and behold, there was a case where the police investigated a, um, a trafficking ring where six women from Asia were brought into the country, forced into prostitution. One of them had cigarette burns on her arms, weren't allowed to leave. And I was like, this is happening in the modern day, and it's happening less than two miles from the Brown University campus. And there was so little community outrage about it, um, so little, uh, so few options that those women had at the time. And I remember struggling with these issues of, here I was at dinner having a philosophical conversation saying, had I lived back during times when things were not so, answers were not so simple, here is what I, where I would have been, and then being confronted with what's happening in the modern day, and the answer seems to be pretty simple now, you ha like we need to take a stance against this. Uh, so that winter break came back on campus because I was working on yet another psychology research effort with the professor and started thinking through, here I am about to graduate, and what do I do with these skills? And um, so my friend, one of my friends from that dinner conversation, Derek Ellerman, we graduated in the same class. He was a cognitive neuroscience major. I was a psych major. And how did two scientists decide to come together to fight slavery? Uh, that you can kind of keep, with, uh, keep that question with you. But so I was talking to Derek and I was like, we really need to do something, but there's really no role for us because 10 years ago, everything that was being done to confront and address the problem of slavery and trafficking was done at the government level. We weren't government official, we weren't lawyers, we weren't the police. We were just a everyday community member student. And I remember asking, well, what is our role then? Let's look back to, we had conversations about the Underground Railroad. What did it, what did it look like back then beyond, oh, there are some uh, back rooms behind walls or attics, and uh, what did it take? And, it, and we came to the conclusion, it took everyone. It took people who were um, uh, serving in religious communities, it took er um, everyday people, it took uh, political leaders, and so we decided to create Polaris Project, nonprofit named after the North Star to symbolize the strength of what happens when communities come together. So let me fast forward. The day after graduation, uh, we started up here, spring semester, put together a business plan, uh, won a second place award from the Brown Entrepreneurship Competition. I, didn't, I never saw myself as an entrepreneur. I never saw myself as starting up anything that it was actually quite frightening to me. And so we decided we need to be in DC. If that is where the action is, and in, or, in order to create change, we know we need to affect policy at some level. So let's move to DC. Packed up a U-Haul, literally the day after graduation. Didn't know anyone. Our parents thought we were crazy. We moved to DC, and within, a f uh, within the first few months, it was this eerie deja vu experience of, rather than a physical newspaper, we had a Google Alerts for any term that could be related to potential trafficking. And I open up my email one day, and out pops a very similar article 
of a, in Virginia, a women from Asia who uh, were in a massage, found in a massage parlor, arrested on prostitution charges, and awaiting deportation. So to fast forward, we said, oh, this time we're equipped with information to do something about this. The first time when we were students at Brown, the, it was just a blip on the radar. We didn't know what to do. Uh, and then now we called up uh, that newspaper reporter and followed these breadcrumbs. Eventually, we were able to go into those detention facilities and uh, talk to the women week after week after week, uh, questioning, should we even spend like the $20 in gas to go out? Maybe we're just seeing, we want to see trafficking everywhere. Uh, but it turned out that these women were similar to the women that we read in the Providence Journal, brought into the country, forced to prostitution. And over the last 10 years, we found it's not just women from Asia and sex trafficking, it's um, migrant laborers, sex uh, labor trafficking happening in people's homes. And, and, but from that first case experience, we realized there is that whole power of the individual or the one or two people. And uh, we're thinking, what would a underground railroad look like in the 21st century, given telecommunications and the networks that we have? So we just started with a simple idea that worked in uh, the local, what we were doing in Washington, D.C., and it was this idea of a hotline, of picking up, we would take in calls from uh, the police and uh, work with victims of trafficking, make sure that they got the help that they needed. And what we did was we started locally, built it out nationally. Right now, Polaris Project runs a 24-hour hotline 120 language capacity on human trafficking and modern slavery. And in just the last four, five years alone, 60,000 60, calls have come in. Of those 60,000 calls, more than 7,500 victims of trafficking were identified here in the US. 2,500 cases were opened up by law enforcement as a result of those calls. And to give you an example, those calls weren't uh, anything that is outside our day-to-day uh, -day experiences. School teacher called us one day saying, you know, someone came in and just presented on trafficking, and I noticed that in my after-school program, uh, two of the young students that I teach from Mexico, they just kind of mysteriously disappeared three weeks ago, and then all of a sudden they reappeared, but they just seem so different, and they've disappeared again. I don't know if this is trafficking or not, but um, can you help me with this case and help me find them? So we worked with the school teacher, pulled together all the details, forwarded it to the federal uh, law enforcement partners we had. Within three days, they were able to identify these two teenage girls in South Carolina who are being brutalized in an underground sex trafficking network, forced to have sex with 30 men per day. And that's because that teacher's eyes was opened. She picked up a phone call. We worked our modern version of the underground railroad network and action happened. Another call, uh, two o'clock, or I think this was in the afternoon. Four o'clock in the afternoon, we get a call from a young man at a payphone in San Diego. I don't even know how he got our number, but somehow he got a hold of the National Human Trafficking number and said, I don't even know where I am. Someone just gave me this number, and I've been forced to sell magazines door to door, told that I'd make all this money, and all of a sudden, the crew that I was with left me stranded because I wasn't meeting my quota. I haven't had any food in the last four days, and all I want to do is get back home. So then we called up one of our partners in San Diego and said, Marissa, where, he's at this intersection. How soon can you get there? And she said, oh, I'm just 10 minutes away. I'll go by, pick him up, and make sure that he gets all his needs met. And that's what a modern-day underground railroad looks like. Some random community member we can't even give credit for helped to change this young man's life. And so there are, like those are just two stories that I'm giving you, but multiply that by the 60,000 calls that have come in. And 
if you were to ask me today, like how, a lot of people ask me, well, did you study nonprofit management? How did you do bookkeeping? How, like, did you, were you a business strategy person? How did you know what to do and to build, to help build and create the strategies uh, within Polaris Project to have the type of social impact that you have? I mean, even from a public policy perspective, the last 10 years when we first started, only two states had laws on the books to criminalize trafficking. And we went state by state by state by state. Now, 10 years later, we can say every single state, with the exception of Wyoming, has some law protecting victims. And people say, well, because I live in DC, they just automatically assume that I'm a lawyer, or I was trained on public policy, and maybe I can credit the city politics class that I took. But for the most part, no, I wasn't trained to do victim services specifically, or public policy advocacy specifically, or social entrepreneurship, or nonprofit management, or accounting and bookkeeping. And where I credit it is the simple fact of there are so, some of the most intractable problems in society, there are no clear answers. So when you're confronted with that level of complexity, where do you fall back on? And usually you f when you're faced with confusion, you fall back on the knowledge you've gained over time. And for me, I'm glad it wasn't just in a lab or just in the science library reading journals. And somehow, I still don't even know how to answer that question. Somehow, the liberal arts education that I received, that Derek received, gave us the skills and certainly confidence and the courage to create something into this unknown that we didn't even know what we were stepping into because we had a foundation that, all right, let's just step into a complex, ugly problem and see what we can do to resolve it together. So thank you again so much for coming here and uh, supporting the event today. It is a pleasure to be here with you.